Here's a modern day mathematician. He is keen on prime numbers, calculus, Euler's equation, and everything related to number theory. He's uh, a principal engineer here at Leapfrog, and here, he's here to talk about how you go from development to production. Let's welcome Robus Gauli onto the speaker's platform. Welcome, Robus. Hi, Kritika. Hi, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? I hope you can. Loud and clear. Awesome. So, yeah, um, I think I need to first share my screen. Sorry. <laughs> can you guys see my screen? Yes, dev to production. So, uh, hi guys. Um, so I'm Robus. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kritika, for such a warm welcome. And nice to know that I was a mathematician back then. <laughs> uh, so, um, so first of all, um, welcome to Syntax 2021, everyone. And uh, um, so, for starting, so I just want to um, lay out a few foundations. So. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Dave to Production, um, Quest for Better Soft, Better Engineering Practices, which is kind of vague, but I'm, I'll try my best to explain what does that even mean in the first place. So let's begin. Uh, so about me, so yeah, uh, as you already know, I'm Robus. I'm a principal engineer here at Leapfrog. I, in a day-to-day -day work, I mostly juggle between uh, architecture, infrastructures, and operations. Um, people call me, I do uh, drawing with boxes and arrows, but I guess they're, they're, they're kind of right. And in terms of tech stack, um, I usually um, am doing most of the time Go, Python, and sometimes Rust, C, C++ uh, in my in a part time, kind of outside my job. And JavaScript, yeah, obviously, honestly, yeah, JavaScript, TypeScript. And uh, apart from the language and the stacks, I'm usually involved in uh, cloud native architectures and infrastructures surrounding Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesos, and, and lots and lots of open platform like open tracing, open telemetry, open kind of everything. So I just wrote OpenX. Um, so yeah, that's about me. And if you want to know more about my work or about my um, other things, so go check out robust.dev. Yep, that's it. So yeah, before we begin, uh, I just want to set up a context um, so this talk is not necessarily about specific tools or language or any, any framework, but rather it's more towards like uh, building a decision tree or a framework, if you like, um, in, in regards to taking those technical decisions in terms of infrastructure operations or even finding the coding patterns or even figuring out how you're going to handle errors or how you're going to make sure everyone is uh, equipped with the right tools and um, stacks uh, in, in regards to logging or even metrics or things like that, right? So I just want to, um, don't want to give any sort of preference in terms of tools, but I just want to set up a foundational aspect so that you can make a decision in your project, starting from the development to productions and beyond production, it could be uh, in terms of maintenance as well, right? So yeah, uh, that's, um, I just want to make the expectation clear. So um, so let's start. Uh, so this is, uh, let's start with a scenario of uh, project X. Um, it could be anything. So let's look at the brief timeline. Um, so during one month of a project, if you guys can relate, like usually what happens is teams are pumped up and they are ready to, uh, you know, hit the go button and open up the PS code editor and do coding, right? But, uh, and sorry, uh, and, and between that, like, team uh, selects to go with the microservice architectures and sometimes they want to do micro front ends and you know go mono repo right now the trend is kind of you know uh, everything mono repo and they have a database set up there's a migration ready already like they have a migration script ready and you have a fully documented code and with 100 percent test coverage any guesses why is that the case why there's a 100 percent test coverage and fully documented and anyone to shout out in the chat what might be the reason No one? Because we have not yet started coding, right? So everything is kind of 100% in terms of code coverage and documentations. <laughs> so um, if you want to see the team's footage during those initial first month, it looks something like this because everything is shiny, everything is delightful, right? So by the way, um, the middle one is 
PM in a project. <laughs> if anyone is confused. Um, so when you are into project and it's kind of four to five months into the project, things look a bit different. Like something is not right. Something is not cooking, right? So it could be that. A any cases why, why, why is the situation like this? Or into you have a project, things is kind of upside down, right? So <laughs> nothing is making sense. Like your build is taking hours. Your development platform requires a lot of dependencies. You know, things are pretty much messed up. So I like my experience in, in Leafrock and even different companies where I work, projects seem to have a relatively good health during the first initial months, but you know, in a later time, it's the situation is always going to be like this. Sometimes dependencies is not mass, sometimes the version is mismatched, sometimes there is a different version of a database in the server and in you know, local machines, things are not looking good, right? So this is kind of the scenario. So where did it all go wrong, right? So what could be the reason behind like all of those, um, you know, messiness in the project when you when you start initially, which is kind of good, and then, you know, how did it get my friend? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so there must be something going wrong, right? So because initially that's the kind of a, a greener green situation like everything is happy and everything is well but during the uh, like when when you go to the months or even years things are not looking good right so let's discuss about this so um let's start with the first topic of the day which is dependency management any guesses in the chat what does that mean what does that dependency management mean anyone wants to go Sorry, my chat is on the other month or so. My God, it, environments and packages. Yep, yep, environments and packages. It does. All about the bundle size. What do you mean know a bundle size? Is it like JavaScript bundle size? Do you know? I hope so. Any other guesses? Right on. The lesson I learned that is don't really do it. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, things go wrong, right? Everywhere, back and forth, left and right. So yeah, um, without a further ado, I just wanna go into the topic. So what do I mean by dependency management? It's not to be confused with a dependency injection because people tend to be confused with the design pattern. Uh, this is not that one. Um, so this is something related to, um, I'll just explain it going forward. Um, so let's look at the scenario when you want to onboard any dev by dev right so let's look at what kind of onboarding process happens during the initial phase of the project right so you git clone the repo right you ask them to git clone the repo sorry and ask them to go through the readme and do that uh, build command it could be terraform apply or it could be yarn start right depending upon the project you are so if it's a web application it could be yarn build yarn start npm run start what have you and if you're the infrastructure side of things it could be anything it can be a script it could be shell script it could be terraform apply or anything like that it does not matter so it looks good right everything is shiny happy but what happens when you are in the half of, you know, when you are into a six month of the project and your onboarding process what does it looks like look like sorry um you ask them to git clone the repo. You go through the readme, readme, sorry. You Terraform ask them to Terraform stat and wait. What happens is um, your tech lead asks you to download the specific version of a Terraform, which is 4.12.24. And he also asks you to install the YAN version that is specific 1.32, right? So what, ha well, what you end up doing is you then end up installing a YVM, which is another package manager for maintaining the YANs. Uh, different versions and you point to the 1.32, right? And that's done. Then again, he asks you to download RabbitMQ because turns out your project depends on the RabbitMQ, which is using the messaging service because obviously you are doing a microservice architecture, right? So that's the case. And um, you have a Postgres to install and also Airflow because turns out your retail process requests Airflow again uh, also. And wait, 
Worst Chris person needs to be above 10 because there's an issue and which uh, team members are still trying to figure out, but they can't again, right? So after all these, you end up setting up the development environment and you end up running your project within a local machine. And what they ask in a later time in the project is to install a AWS CLI because it turns out you are using, your project is using S3 to upload few artifacts, right? Or AWS, sorry, kubectl if because they are using a Kubernetes and it turns out you, you, you don't know what the heck is kubectl or even the Kubernetes, right? So you can, you can see the difference between what you have to deal with when you are uh, along, you are, you are in the, uh, six months or one year into the project versus when you are initially onboarded into the project, right? So, and you, you will be like something like this, right? <laughs> something is not right, obviously, because all of this dependency is not gonna make you happy, obviously. So what do you think your CICD pipeline would look like now, uh, now that everything is, uh, you know, uh, sort of working, but you can imagine it's on the next level, right? It just bomb blasted with all of the broken installations and all things like that. So most common thing that I've seen in CI CD pipeline is usually your CI CD pipeline has a universe installation to do. So what do I mean by that? So if you guys can relate, like every time you make any build or you trigger any build in your CI CD pipeline, you must have a all of those dependencies installed, right? So it got installed Yarn, it got installed Node.js or Terraform or AWS CLI or, or, or even JQ or even curl, right? So these kind of, all of the tools must be installed in your uh, CI platform or the runner, if you, if you will. And only then when you install those kind of external dependencies, then only, only you can build your applications, right? So every single time you have those universal, universal installations. And sometimes what happens is your project goes, um, hey, um, your team tech lead goes, um, sorry, your tech lead um, upgrades the version of, uh, I don't know, uh, some, some, some package or a binary, and he misses that to update in a, a CI CD pipeline, right? So it turns out, uh, do you sense you, do you have a different version, uh, it's gonna blast. And sometimes during the installation, your CI just times out, right? It cannot manage that as well. So every single time when you when you expect your CI to per, like be consistent and reliable, it always goes away, right? So what did we miss? Like, what do you think should be done? A any suggestion in the chat? Like, how can we prevent this kind of stuff? Containerize, right? Awesome. Anyone? Docker. <laughs> Everyone is Docker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isolation Docker and things like that. Synchronization. Awesome. Synchronization. Yeah, makes sense because you want to synchronize the versions of the upstream and the local version, right? That makes sense. Yep. So let me um, start. So thing is, we Dockerized our app. Let's say like you are into the microservice, so obviously you are going to Docker as an application, but didn't manage to isolate the operational dependencies, right? So every single time I, I see in the projects, they like the, the tech lead or the team lead, whoever is responsible in the project, they tell me like, hey, my application is Dockerized. I have a Docker file and then my application it kind of runs in a different platform. So I don't need to worry about all of those dependencies. But in terms of operational dependencies, they is kind of they like they they pass out basically like they cannot uh, explain me like the, how they are managing the operational dependencies right so this is kind of a problem everywhere so so note like application dependencies like obviously you guys would have a Docker file in your application right uh, either it's Node.js Golang Rust I don't care but how about the operational dependencies right so it's a it's a different kind of thing so. As I already said, um, application dependencies are required by application runtime. Run so for example, um, if you have an express application, um, so you have an app server, so what you need is you require a Node.js in order to run that application, right? So that's an application runtime. Um, so that kind of dependencies is called application dependencies, right? But if your application requires, you know, um, 
requires you to build the application, test, or even release those kind of dependencies, those kind of tools. For example, that could be, um, I don't know, Docker, even Docker, that could be Docker, like, or even AWS, right? AWS CLI or Azure CLI that needs to authenticate against Azure or even AWS and uh, make sure those Docker images that you built is pushed to the ECR or the ACI registry or even the Docker app, does not matter, right? So these are the dependencies um, that we call operational dependencies. So I've already given, um, I think that's pretty much clear. So what does application dependencies and operational dependencies mean? So can we fix it somehow? Like, can we make sure like operational dependencies are also taken care of? Uh, like, like similarly what we do for the application dependencies? And the answer is obviously yes. So thing is, um, I will not like give you um, this, the specific implementation. Like I don't want you to, you know, prefer this implementation. There are different implementations like in terms of approaching this problem and solving this, but I'll give you one of the approach, right? So what we typically do is, um, first thing first, we create a Docker file with all of those operational dependencies baked into it, right? So that's one thing. So, uh, it's okay, like if it does not make sense in the first time, I will have a different uh, example later on. But yeah, first thing first, we create a Docker file. So keep in mind, this Docker file is not the same Docker file that you build uh, that you use for your application, right? So second thing is um, you create a build or a test script that wraps um, your operational Docker emails. So uh, this is a script. Um, could be a bash shell or even a make file it does not matter it has to be some sort of build system that will allow you to wrap your operational docker image right i'll come come to this later um and finally you execute the command all right so let me uh, go into the code if that's comfortable uh, for you guys so yeah first thing first um, create a Docker file with all the operational de dependencies baked into it, right? So what does that mean? So this is a sample Docker file um, with all of those dependencies that I just mentioned. So if you look closely, we have all of the versions of all of the CLIs or the dependencies that is required um, uh, blocked here. And if you look at here, this is kind of odd. It's instead of we installing Express, or sorry, uh, installing the, uh, yeah, doing Yarn install or downloading specific versions of Node.js runtime, we are kind of installing curl, ZQ, or Bass itself, right? Or if you, if you look closely, Gomplate, or Onzip, or even AWS CLI, or Kubernetes, right? Or KubeCTO, Velero. So it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of Docker file, right? It, it is Docker file just to manage your operational dependencies, right? If that makes sense. Um, so the other thing is, second thing is creating a build or a test script uh, that wraps your operational Docker image. So what do I mean by that? So as you can see, like when you create a Docker file and you have a Docker image, it um, doesn't matter where you push that Docker image, it could be Docker up or AWS registry or anything like that. Um, doesn't matter, but once you create the Docker image, you then actually need to use that Docker image, right? So to, in order to use that Docker image, you gotta have a, well, you gotta either, you know, in a terminal go Docker run. And, you know, if you, if you look into the snippet here, you gotta do Docker run, uh, dash dash item, dash ref entry point and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of lengthy, right? So every time you want to run uh, some command inside a Docker, you, you have to always run this lengthy, I mean, type this lengthy um, commands, it's not that feasible. So that's why we kind of use a build or a test script that wraps those, you know, messiness and give you a simple command to execute. So what it does basically right now, if you look closely, um, it creates a command. So right now the command is docker slash terraform dash in it. So if uh, you can figure it out, it basically tries to initialize a terraform, right? And in order to do that, first thing, what we do is in a Docker image that we created for the operational dependencies, we put an entry point um, to Terraform, which is a CLI, basically a binary. So what it does is it, um, it makes your Docker image uh, act as a Terraform CLI, right, basically. So uh, once you do desktop entry point, it pulls Terraform, 
your Docker image suddenly becomes or suddenly acts like a Terraform CLI, basically, right? So instead of you having Terraform in your local machine, uh, local machine, um, you have a Terraform inside a Docker image and you're uh, signifying the entry point there as a Terraform, right? And what you do is you volume mount your source code, actual code, uh, actual source code, your Git tree, right? Because any sort of commands, either it is building or even it is testing or even formatting or even linting, you require your source code to source code to be mounted so that you can run those commands against that source code, right? So if it's kind of tricky, but hold on to it, it's going to be fruitful, right? Uh, so first thing first, you set up an entry point and then you volume mount. And finally, what you do is you basically run the actual command that you want to run, which is in it, right? So it's exactly equivalent equivalent to um, doing Terraform in it. But instead of you doing in a local machine, what you do is you do inside a Docker image and basically run Terraform in it inside it, mounting your source code, if that makes sense. Uh, everyone with me? I hope that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So um, next is, sorry. So next is, so next example could be, you know, um, this is for building a React app. So for that as well, we have a command called docker slash build, sorry, docker slash build. And what it does is similar thing. It makes right now, if you look at closely, the entry point is not Terraform, it's a yarn. Because uh, turns out the image, the operational dependency image has a yarn inside it. And now, right now, I'm pointing, I'm setting the entry point to be a yarn, so which makes that Docker image act as a yarn CLI. So instead of you having a local uh, yarn version, you are utilizing the Docker image, the yarn of a yarn inside a Docker image, and using that in order to build an application, right? And again, mount the source code and things like that. But yeah, it's a pretty simple, not that complicated. So finally. Obviously, now you have a Docker image. You have already uh, created those command. Basically, now you got to do is from the terminal to make Docker slash Terraform in it. Now, there you go. What happens is now uh, Docker is instantiated, source code is mounted, and um, the command is executed. Right. So if you look closely here, um, once you do make Docker slash Terraform in it, um, actually calls the docker run dash dash rm and entry point blah 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 and it basically uh, runs the command inside the docker so for the last time i'm going to do this visually right um so if if there's any questions if if something is not clear please uh, fire the question right in the chat or maybe unmute yourself so this is the last time that i'm going to explain um so first thing is um command to execute. So you do make Docker Terraform, sorry, make Docker slash Terraform in it from the terminal. What happens is it initializes the Docker image and it sets the entry point to Terraform. And, and after that, if you look closely here, uh, the source code is mounted inside the container so that the commands can be executed against your uh, tree. And finally, the actual command is uh, executed from inside the container on the um, from your terminal, right? So everything is kind of uh, proxying, if you like, from the Docker. So if it's upload, test, build, apply, whatever, uh, it's running from inside the container and not from your local machine. That's the key point here. I hope that's pretty clear. Um, so what's the difference? What's the difference that it makes? Um, before, um, what you used to do was um, when you want to build a project, for example, let's say in this case, uh, Express app, you just go into the terminal and uh, do yarn build, right? But now it's a difference. The difference is it's not yarn build, it's make docker slash build, right? So any guess is why I did uh, docker slash build um, because all of the commands uh, is executed inside the docker. So so that uh, it's explicit enough so that everyone knows that the command is running against the Docker. Right? So that's why I just did Docker slash build. So, 
So what did it buy you, right? So that's the main question here, because after all these maintenance, after all these isolations, what did it buy you, right? Um, basically, you want to isolate build process so that the system dependencies work. Right? Yep, pretty much it. Because you cannot trust local machine because everyone has their own state, and sometimes their version does not match with the version of the other individual. And you know, you you know, you know the uh, you know what happens, right? So works on my machine situation every single time. <laughs> so after doing all of those processes, what did it buy you actually, right? So in terms of now development setup, look at the requirements. It's pretty dead simple, right? From now, from now on, like any project, does not matter, is it a wave, is it an API project or, or, or any services or microservice, what have you. The only requirements that right now is Docker and Git. Yep, that's it. Like that's the rule, right? So never ever we have to like ask any developer to you know install a yarn or install npm has to be this person or that person, AWS CLI this person or Terraform CLI this person. We don't care. Just have Docker and Git, and you are you are up and running. And like no dependencies in your local machine to build or even test or even lint or even upload to ECR or S3 or deploy to or anything like that in, during your development life cycle, right? So everything is kind of taken care of because you isolated the operational dependencies in like alongside the application dependencies. So what about CI? So what do you think CI happens right now? What's the changes in CI that we could make, right? So now that you have isolated the operational dependencies, now your CI um, and the local system would look something like this. So for example, you want to build your application. Your local command would be make docker slash build, right? And in CI, that's the same thing, no difference, because you're using the same operational layer in the local environment as well as in the CI environment, right? So for the test, obviously make docker slash test. And obviously you guessed it, it's like make a docker slash test, no difference, right? And for everything else as well, for even if you want to do a dry run, even on a lint or format, everything is the same. Nothing is different. And even to deploy the application into a production cluster or any any kind of environment that you have set up, it's a Docker slash deploy, Docker slash deploy in the CI as well as in the local, right? So no difference at all. So um, this is the actual source code from our project, which is a Bitbucket CI script. And it utilizes the same mechanism that I just uh, talked about previously. And in there, you can see that um, for the lint and plan, we use the same command, docker slash Terraform lint. And again, for the test, we do the same thing. We do docker slash test, docker slash integration test. Everything runs, runs from the docker. And for even the uh, actual uh, deployment of the uh, uh, Terraform, we use the same command. So I think. That's that's the means of power here because now that you have encapsulated both the dependencies and the complexities, now your CI is kind of uh, it just a, it does not require any sort of you know uh, hey I need to install that I need to install this or you need to be of a specific version you need to be a specific version of Linux even CI and CI CIC CD pipeline only requires you to have a VM and a Git and a Docker similar to what you require in a local machine right. So that's the key thing. So what's the conclusion here? Um, so isolating operational complexity is equally, if not more important than isolating application complexity. That's the first thing, because every time I've, um, um, I've seen in the project, application complexity is kind of uh, taken care of, but operational complexity is always something that needs to be taken care of, uh, and which is kind of ignored most of the time. Uh, don't expect developer to manage dependencies. Um, that's one of the key fault that we do and that uh, kind of lags our projects and the productivity of the team. And also your CI, CD and staging environments and a local should share the same common operational and application dependencies, right? So that's I think that one of the uh, most important principle that you can take out of uh, this talk. If, if, if. Yeah. Uh, so, is there any question? All right. Are we opening the floor for questions now, Robus?
Uh, how many minutes do I uh, have? Do you think how many minutes do I have? I'm not sure. You've got 15 minutes uh, if you want to continue anything or if you want to take questions. Uh, I think I'm going to continue. Yes. All right. Awesome. Not, 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 awesome. So if I'm taking the question, do you use multiple documentation? Uh, how do you separate document and proxy environment? Is this true? So that's an answer. Yeah. No, uh, we use the same Docker image. And right. the only thing that kind of is uh, messy or let's say complicated is when you want to build a docker image uh, from inside your docker image or the operational dependencies image right uh, in that case you have to do dind which means docker inside the docker that's kind of tricky but obviously that can be done but i've never sure you know having any issues in development and production using a sep so i don't separate out those kind of thing so um before that i just want to tell uh, is, is um if you want to look at the actual example uh, of how this is kind of set up, uh, you can check out my repository in GitHub. Uh, I'll provide a link um, later in the uh, slide. So um, the next one, um, this is the next topic that I want to cover, which is um, about a programming language features and patterns. So uh, I'm just going to um, clearly state that this is uh, a bit opinionated and it might create a controversy, uh, but yeah, um, I think that's let's 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 move into it. So let's talk about features and patterns in languages, right? Um, so uh, I mean, I hope like you guys uh, kind of you guys are kind of familiar with uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, or Python, or any sort of high-level language, or even Java or, or C sharp, whatever. And there are features like map and reduce and filters to manipulate those uh, vectors or arrays, right? And there is a concept of uh, the notions of the classes and objects, you know, um, separating, uh, like uh, encapsulating the behaviors and the data kind of things, right? And there's an idea of first class functions and uh, single it is kind of a hot topic nowadays. People talk about concurrency and things like that, right? And uh, error handling, like, uh, put everywhere try except catch plug right so i call it a throw everything and handle nothing pattern because you your code kind of always catches but kind of does nothing except for console logging <laughs> at least that's the case uh, in my in my site so and also in terms of like uh, programming patterns um usually we have singleton patterns and factory patterns and multi-hierarchy patterns, like multi-hierarchy meaning you have a multiple inheritance and you have an inheritance of the inheritance kind of things, right? And try accept control. So this guy, this is the kind of a patterns that we have already have, right? But um, let's step back. Um, let's evaluate programming from the first principle of the axioms, if you like. Um, so, if if you if you if you think about it, what does it mean to program, right? So it's always going to be input, and your input will have some have some sort of a transformation function uh, that transforms your input to obviously an output, right? So if I give you an example of this, um, so let's say if uh, if you have an input of three and you are um, you know um, providing a function of square, you get a nine, obvious, right? Or if I put an arrowers there and I put it um, with a function of length, then it will give me a five. So it's always going to be input and output. Or even if I uh, have an input of query, a user, and I provide that with a find function, then it will give me a, uh, some output, which is, uh, it, it could be JSON, CSP, it does not matter, right? So it just, it's an input and output pattern. And also, if I type in a robust dev in some browser that has HTTP compatibility, I'll give an HTML output in return, right? So if you think about it, it's nothing but there's a data, you want to do some sort of transformation in the data, and you have an output, right? And of course, there's a catch. The catch is sometimes your transformation function has side effects. Sometimes. It's not always, but it has a side effects. So for example, when you, uh, you know, when you do three squared, it's a nine. That does not really have a side effects, right? it's always going to be a nine. If you are a functional programmer, then you call it a pure function, if that makes sense. And 
if let's say uh, you know you have a um, you have a query to HTTP server, um, sometimes it returns a CMO and sometimes it does not. Um, it might not uh, return because it has a dependency to the IO and your kernel is kind of panicking or something like that. So it has kind of a side effects, right? It uh, it has a possibility of an error, basically. So uh, so in programming, like in general. There's a function. There's a transformation of a function. So, sorry, transformation of an input and an output. And sometimes it has a side effects, and sometimes it does not. So that's one thing. So programming is all about input to output. That's kind of we know. But what's the requirement for the computations? What's the actual requirements here? So let's say, for example, if I want to write a hello world, or if I want to write a program that sends me to the Mars, what is the actual requirements in order to compute those kind of tasks? Let's discuss. So first thing, you should have an ability to read from a memory. That's a one requirement. The second one is you should be able to write to the memory. That's a second requirement, right? So the third one is you should be able to, to you know, do the conditional branch. So for example, let's say if X is more than 45, do this or else do that, right? So that's the requirement, right? So and the finally, this is kind of optional, but you should have some sort of control flows construct. So for example, for loop, simple as that, right? So it allows you to loop uh, depending on the condition. So that's not my claim. That's uh, something verified and as a rigorous proof by Turing and along with charts, if you're interested in that. But yeah, definitely, these are only the requirements, right? So what does that mean? I mean, um, so you got, you have like a classes and objects, you have like a abstract based classes, design patterns and global states and singleton patterns and factory patterns. But in order to be computational, uh, in order to be universally computational, you just need three constructs, right? One is to, to be able to read, to be able to write, to have a, some sort of a uh, conditional branch. That's about it. So let's see, uh, let's take an example case of Golang. Uh, this is one of the languages that is recently kind of popular. And I hope you guys know about it, but the implementation is not that important, but let's see, uh, look at the case study here. So first thing first, Golang does not care about try catch exception. Hey, no try catch. What does that even mean, right? Golang does not have classes and object. What? Right? So it, it, it's kind of surprising, right? It does not even have a try catch. It does not have a classes and object. It does not even have an inheritance, right? Or does not have map release filters, while loop to while loop, right? Or even a generators and coroutines that we are we are kind of flexing about, right? In Python or Node.js, say, hey, do you know generators and coroutines? It does not really care about that. It does not have it at all. Or doesn't even have a abstract based classes or super subclasses. No macros and templates. Nothing. But it empowers 100% of a cloud native infrastructure. Your Docker, your Kubernetes, your Falco, your Lambdas, your everything is written in Golang, right? So something must be right there, right? So if these, these kind of constructs are not available in the language, available in the language, there must be something that they are doing right. So um, what did they do right? That's the question here. So instead of try catch, errors are nothing but a values. It's kind of hard to wrap initially, but uh, I hope to make it clear a bit later. Um, so as similar to like, if your function returns any kind of values in Golang, if there's an error, then the function returns a value, which is of type error. That's the only difference, right? So it does not have a class as an object, obviously, but it does have a struct. And what does struct mean? Struct is kind of a, uh, let's call it a, a container that can contain data. It could be float into a string, it does not matter, but it kind of uh, have an encapsulation property where you can encapsulate those kind of data, right? And it does not have an inheritance or no map filters reduce while do I loop, but just for loop, right? Or no generators and queries. It does not have that. No abstract based classes, no macros and templates. But instead of macros, templates, or those kind of inheritance uh, features, it does have one single feature that is interface, right? It's just a single feature. So let's look at the error pattern first. What do I mean by error at just being as a value? So first thing, there's a one example. There's a first example. This is the first example of no error handling at all. So let's say, um, sorry, 
I just want to focus on this. Uh, let's say you want to get a user. So if you get a user, uh, you return a user payload. And once you do that, you add that to the list of mentors or list of parents, right? The second one is if you are kind of a good coder or a coder with the standards maintained in the project, you will use a try catch, obviously. So in try catch situation, what happens is you try to get a user. And if you don't find one, there's a catch happening. So you catch a user missing exception if you look closely, right? And if there's an error, then you have to create a user, right? So if the user does not exist, then obviously you create a user. And once you create a user, you basically then finally do the same thing, which is adding to the list of mentors and adding to the list of parents, right? So that's one thing. But in the case of error as a value, what happens is when you do user.get, it does not return just user. It also returns another value, which is an error, right? So I hope that makes sense now, right? So user.get now does not return a single value, but it returns a two value which is user and an error, right? So if there's an error, so if an error equals user.missing, then you create a user and then you notify, right? And you do the same thing. So look at the difference, right? You can clearly see the difference. In the second example, try as mix error as a secondary citizen, if that makes sense. Means like error is kind of there, but it's optional. You can handle it. You can wrap that with a try catch and kind of you know deal with it but it's not the primary citizen of the language but in the case of error as a value you have no choice right you have no choice because you have to either you have to either ignore that error which is not possible function user.get always returns your two values so you don't have any choice so in that case you have to first thing is handle the error and create a user and then do the rest of the stuff, right? So it's pretty straightforward in terms of control flow. But if you look closely in the try catch situation, you have an optional feature. It's a kind of optional. You don't even have to, you know, handle layer. And if you handle layer, it does not look, you know, um, straightforward. If you like, it does not look straight, or it's not like uh, straight uh, in terms of like making sense, right? I, we have to go to the catch statement, and inside the catch statement, there's a create. And you wonder why is there's a user missing exception and why is there why is uh, other exception not handled? So you end up handling other exceptions and your code kind of look a bit mess there. But in this case, it's a simple thing. You are just treating error as a value, right? So what's the conclusion here? So make sure um, first thing is you treat error as a first class value, so the citizen error language. So ideally, if it's possible, there's a, there has to be no compilation without explicit error handling. And second is, there must only be one way of doing things. I'm pretty sure like in your code base, if you go to the PR section, there's always going to be a fight about, hey, map versus reduce, right? Or for is versus for loop, right? So this is why, why is this the case? Because your language provides you a different ways of doing the same thing. But if there's only one thing of doing thing, then obviously there's no fights, there's no such issues, and things look good. And also, if a new dev come into the team, there's no second guess, right? And think about this. You might not even request singleton pattern in a first place, because if your language does not allow you to create a global state, where would you care? If, if you guys are aware of singleton pattern, then it's a pattern to handle a global state gracefully. But if you don't even get one global state, then why you would require that? So think about those patterns. And even the factory pattern. So factory pattern is kind of a way to you know, um, handle object creations. But if you don't even have a notion of a class as an object, you don't even need to care about that, right? And the last thing is more, very important. Use language that is a native construct for side effects management. So for example, in a Go, uh, or Java in a TypeScript, there's a thing called an interface, right? So what does it does is it basically allows you to swap dependencies of, in a broader term, people usually call it dependency injection, but I like to call it dependency management, right? So 
these are the construct that allows you to swap the dependencies so that during tests, you don't need to care about all of those side effects. And during integrations, you don't even need to think about, you know, how to manage those complexity because you are easily able to swap the dependencies. And if you're using some sort of functional language, maybe use Monad. Obviously, Haskell users knows about the Monad or even JS. If you guys know Promise, that's actually a Monad. If you think about it, that's actually a Monad. Because, because Monad is a thing that wraps your object or the values uh, with the side effects and it maintains the side effects. And if you think about it, JavaScript, when you get a result that has a side effects, it returns your promise instead of actual value, right? So try to using those kind of concepts and use a language that provides those constructs orthogonally, right? So yeah, um, conclusion is uh, less feature is equals good feature. So yeah, I think that's about it. Good again. Thank you so much. I think I'll go for the question if there's any. There's a lot of content, but I don't think that I'll be able to manage this. So yeah. Fantastic, Rubos. I think a lot of people were able to connect with what you were sharing because I saw the chat was pretty popping um, during your presentation. I do not see any instant questions right now from the chat. If anybody has anything, please feel free to place them to Rubos. But I have a few questions for you. So while people are figuring out their yourself. questions, let me just <laughs> um, let me just uh, get something up here. What are the must learn things for developers to be productive in what we do or what they do? Can you repeat that? What are the you must learn things? You know, as mm -hmm. a developer, you must learn things uh, for developers to be productive in their day to day. You know, because going to production is not just a you come do it today. There's anything that you preach about or you encourage practicing, like the tip that you had at the very end, less features are good features. So something that you're very proactive and preachy about. Yeah. I think the one thing that I can provide is if um, the rule of thumb would be like, if you code, if you can, you know, um, make sure like your code is readable and understandable by 10 year old kid who is kind of, you know, just one month or two months into the programming. And if you can explain that clearly, I think you're writing a good code. That's the rule of thumb because complexity is kind of key to destruction, disaster, sorry, right? So every time, if you introduce new features like closer or generators or coroutines, it's kind of, it's kind of fancy, but <laughs> in the long run, it's kind of, you know, um, what the heck man, like, why did I write those things in the first place is a thing that will come up obviously an event driven. So try to make it simple as much as possible. I think that works with life as well. Sure. You know, <laughs> keep things simple. Uh, there's one question that I think would be relevant to a lot of people in the audience. We have a mix of uh, professionals and, you know, people who are just starting off in tech. The question is, what advice do you give to developers who are about to take on a senior role or, you know, participate as a team lead? Okay, advice from my side mm -hmm. for people going from developers to now a senior or team lead right right so i think for me at least that's my experience every single time um as a senior dev what i focus is not on the code or you know writing the best possible implementation of any feature but what I'm always focused in as a senior Dave is how do I augment or equip my team members with the right tools or the right solutions so that they are productive. So that's the only focus that I always have. So for example, uh, in my project, um, let's say there's a one project in a uh, company that's, uh, I don't want to name names, but my decision would be like, hey, um, the tech leader, the team leads of the project would come and ask me, hey, do I want to use Express or do I want to use that library or this library? And, you know, do I want to choose a framework? So my instinct, instinct is, hey, this instinct is like, this project is going to last for a year. So during those years, there, is going, there are going to be 60, 70 developers that's going to, you know, go in and out of the project. So in that situation, how do I handle this? That's the, my first question. That's my first question. And that, in order to solve that, first thing that matters to me is consistency and readability, right? Again, so in terms of consistency, readability, and structures, what's the best solution 
that provide those kind of things. And that is obviously go for a framework, right? For example, because framework like Zango or NestJS does not care about your coding style. Right. It cares about the structures and the structures are all set there and you have to follow the structure because once you follow the structure, the new member in the team also can expect the same structure, right? So, yeah. so that there's no kind of surprise element. So, you know, that's one thing, but definitely augmenting and equipment, like providing the tools and the right stack so that your team members, you know, pushes forward. That's the main goal as a senior dev. 